Thank you, Wesley. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Uma Valetti. Uh, you know, all know Uma. Uh, we are here at the EPIC facility in uh, Emeryville, California, uh, where Upside Foods, uh, congratulations, has uh, gone through FDA approval, is selling in Barcren now. And just two weeks ago, you made a big announcement. All right, so I want to take us back for a second, Uma. You know, Gilded Age, post-Civil War, <laughs> all of the railroads are bringing to Chicago at the Union stockyards, all of the cattle and all of the grain to feed the cattle. And Chicago booms as the, the butcher and feeder of America, right? And you've come out with a big announcement going back to Chicago for the next generation of meat production and the future of, of meat replacing livestock um, in Glenview, Illinois, mm -hmm. which is a little township, just a little, little far from O'Hare, Cub Stadium, et cetera. Um, and you're putting $140 million into the facility there, which we call Rubicon. So. Yes. Buddy, why Chicago? Why Chicago? Uh, well, Chicago is where it all started. For meat in the United States, it was the place where meat was made, was transported, and it created an enormous amount of uh, excitement in the city, employment, and pride. And uh, if you look at what we're trying to do, we're trying to preserve humanity's love for meat. Yeah. We're trying to preserve it in a way that we can also protect life. Mm -hmm. And this has never happened before. And we felt like if we can get an opportunity to do that in Chicago, why not take it? Yeah. And the city of uh, uh, Glenview, the state of Illinois, have been incredible in mm -hmm. offering us um, the red carpet, saying that we want innovation and transformative change happening here on our grounds. Yeah. And they've made a very compelling case. and. We're proud to have been in California, and we're proud that we're expanding into uh, Illinois, and we hope that that becomes a stepping stone yeah. to a number of these things that need to be built across the country. But it starts with just one, and you're sitting in the first one at yeah. Epic. Yeah. This was a pipe dream yeah. just a few years ago, yeah. and now it is real, and this has become foundational to a lot of innovation we're doing to get meat that's delicious, that can offer a lot of possibilities yeah. to the world. And I, we can't wait to talk about well, let's it. Let's talk about some of the what we're going to make there at Rubicon. So yes, at yes. full scale, Rubicon can be making 30 million pounds of meat a year, right? And uh, in cultivated cell structure where we build it up into other products. So I want to know what, what we're going to make coming out of Rubicon. I want everyone to know, right? So let's start with a, a checklist. Can we make that Nashville hot chicken sandwich yes. that is on your website that yes, makes yes, me yes. mouth water every time I see it? Absolutely, yeah, okay. yes. Okay, my son likes chicken tinga. Can we do chicken tinga? Yes, we can. In the, in the burritos, good. Uh, daughter loves uh, like Chinese food, and can I put it in the wok? Can we, can we uh, how about a, my wife loves Caesar salads with chicken nuggets. Can we, the chicken uh, cubes, can we do those? Yeah, you can do really nice tender sliced chicken. Yeah. Put it on a salad you like, and yeah. you can do dumplings if your daughter likes dumplings. Oh, good. Yeah, loves dumplings. Pot stickers more, but <laughs> uh, great. So we're going to be able to make a lot with our base product mm -hmm. here, right, and, and, co and cover a lot of the market. Um, and I just really want to make sure people understand uh, that we there's a lot we can do with this, because when you went through the FDA approval process, we were working with slightly different technology. Mm -hmm. This was the sort of whole cut fillets that you're serving at Bark Rent now, right? Um, tell us about why you went for the whole cut fillets through the FDA when at Rubicon we're doing something slightly different, a little more of a universal product. But tell us why, why we did that. Look, it's a great question. We didn't plan to do it this way because we thought all we would do was bring meat to the table and we're like, let's go after the hardest thing first. Mm -hmm. Because when you try to do the hardest thing first, you try to kind of laser focus on fundamental first principles. And You're what... invoking, give people the reference. If they don't know, do the hard part first. That's John F. Kennedy. 
And I'll also say it's Arvind Gupta, the founder <laughs> of Indie Bio, saying de-risk the hardest things first. But to, just as a nod to that language, thank you. But keep going with it. Yeah. So absolutely. So we started off with just a white whiteboard and said, what's the hardest thing to do in making meat? Mm -hmm. And as we started building it, it became very clear to me, it became clear to my team that putting a full cut whole fillet product, that is all animal cells, yeah. chicken cells, we would learn a tremendous amount from it. And there was just no other shortcut. Because every other shortcut we took yeah. would have just been guessing at the fundamental principles of how meat is being made. Yeah. And that's the reason why we picked chicken fillet, yeah. to say, let's make that our North Star product. Let's show what's possible and have it all be chicken fibers that are the best, tender, most juicy, delicious chicken you can get anywhere in the world. Yeah. And that's what we, that's on the on the market right now. We're learning a tremendous amount of it in understanding how to make it, but also the reaction from the consumers. Yeah. Now, what we've been doing for the last three plus years is recognizing that those insights will let us make a product just as desirable using simpler, scalable technologies that can go to very large mass scale. Yeah. And that's what we've been working on at Epic. Yeah. By that I mean when we go to Rubicon, we're like, we have to get more and more people to be able to access it because not everybody can go to a bar cram. Yeah. And when we start bringing the technology to be simpler and simpler and simpler based on these first principles, the playbook is so much more easier. And that's the reason we did this in this, in this sequence. Yeah. Um, and it's not different for any other industry, by the way. For right. major industries that's transformed, the first products are always the most technologically complex made in small batches, in small scales, even handmade, yeah. to get that, that entire experience. And well, from you that went you to learn the a Tesla lot. Gigafactory in Austin recently. Tell us about the parallel that you see there. Well, Tesla is 20 years old. Yeah. Now, the parallel that is very similar to what we have in Epic is there are multiple ramps that you use for production yeah. for the, the cars. And those ramps are still being built and torn down because they're just not optimal yet. Yeah. We have the same thing at Epic. When we talk to our investors, when we right before when everything sh the world shut down with COVID, yeah, we we, we didn't have Epic. This was just open space. Right. We said we're going to build a ramp of cultivators yeah. that we're going to try first. We have four more ramps we want to build, but we won't build all of them at the same time, right? Because this ramp will likely work for six months or so. We learn a ton from it, and we're right. going to tear that ramp down and build the next one. I, I, I'm, I remember you telling me that. Yes. Right? And I remember being given clear expectation that the machinery is going to rotate out every three to six months as we get better and better at this. Um, and, and just have seen it, seen it going in. And you have uh, some new cultivators that you've developed that are being built now and being tested? Yeah, based on the first generation of the whole cut cultivators, we've learned a tremendous amount. So the second and third generations were put in Epic. Mm -hmm. Based on the second and third generations, we've already learned a tremendous amount of the fourth generation is being built now. Yeah. And we're learning a lot from it. And we're thinking about how we take those to scale. Now, yeah. while we were doing that, we've also unlocked insights that said, these type of cultivators can go to scale much faster. So the ones that are working in Epic in the far back end, the very tall 2000 liter cultivators, mm -hmm. are all going to be the ones that Rubicon is going to be based on. Yeah. Now that technology is really sound. And we're like, take that, that's ready to scale. We'll go to Rubicon with those. And we'll continue to iterate on the other cultivators that will add more texture or more feel, uh, yeah. more feel for, the, for the meat. For, right. If you want to do a steak, it's going to come from the next generation ones. Yeah. And I'm also going to say that if we're, as an investor, one of the things I really know about or excited about Rubicon is that uh, as, as we invested into your last round, you already have the money to build Rubicon, yes. right? We're not out needing that money. That's great. And, and uh, we have confidence that the, the chicken tingas and the national hot chicken sandwiches and the Caesar salads, that, that we're going to have uh, positive unit economics on what comes out of there when we get to full scale to the 30 million pounds a year. So thank you for that. Um, I want to talk about supply chains for a bit. So I mentioned the rail, rail, yes. railroads, right? Yep. The Vanderbilt railroads that brought into Chicago. Part of being in Chicago is for your supply chains uh, and being in the Midwest. Can you talk about uh, what that's going to look like and how that's going to help lower costs over time too? Look, I think it's no uh, secret that for us to get to scale, our supply chains have to get to scale. Yeah. And 
we have to have the logistics, we have to have the, the workforce, the understanding of what it takes for food to get to scale, and we find that in abundance in the Midwest, yeah. which is the reason why we've located our next major facility there. And we're calling it Rubicon because it's absolutely important for the world to recognize that technology like this cannot live on paper forever yeah. with models, and you have to build it, mm -hmm. learn from it, and scale it. Yeah. And Rubicon is at such a large industrial scale of being able to say, if that full production scale is available to us, what that means is any industrial manufacturer can come walk through it and say, I get it. I see the cultivators here making meat, taking five days, seven days, 15 days. I see the meat being harvested. I see it being packaged here. And then you'll start seeing the products like the, the fried chicken sandwich coming yeah. off or a chicken tender coming off mm -hmm. or a chicken breast. Seeing it all on an industrial scale is a must have. It's basically a much larger version of Epic without all the, without all the fancy bells and whistles because this is manufacturing rigor, yeah. cutting out costs everywhere, and then supply chains, when they plug into Rubicon, it'll look as follows. Feed for the animal cells. Yeah. Our cell feed is the most expensive component right now. There are some components that are significantly more expensive because nobody has asked them for that for, at that scale. Yeah. Now what we're doing is working with those suppliers and saying, look, these three components you make that you charge a thousand times more than what we need it for, if you can make a much higher volume at this price, it's a huge business you're opening up in the hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars. That is very attractive for a lot of suppliers. Yeah. And that's what we're doing now with Rubicon as a destination for them. It's not just that we scale some things up, it's also that there's things we used to use that we don't need anymore. We, we made a major advancement with yes. getting rid of platelet uh, 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 growth factor, platelet derived growth factor, which is a fancy way of, when you say platelets, it's like imagine, <laughs> you know, you have a wound and your platelets come cover up the wound and your body grows fast, right? Like it's very natural. These, I, we, we use these big words, I worry that we're conveying something that sounds uh, weird when it's not. It's completely natural and it's completely natural in that period of time that cells will grow fast, but uh, simply uh, using fewer ingredients overall as well and not needing to use some of the, uh, any other, anything else in that space that you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, our supply chain, there are things that we want to negotiate on because we don't need them. Yeah. Because we're removing those things that are so expensive, like the one you talked about, mm -hmm. one is called the platelet-derived growth factor. There are some of our chicken cell lines, or the breeds of cell lines we have that don't need it. Yeah. So why even think about lowering the cost on it. Right, right now it, it adds cost, but when we remove it, it does not need to be. And there's a number of things like that we're working on. Yeah. And the idea is to, for the ones we think are absolutely essential to give the taste and the texture and the flavor, we'll preserve them and work with suppliers to lower the cost. Yeah. And the, for, for the ones we don't need, we don't need them. Yeah. I think the beauty of this is, when we talk about hormone-free, mm -hmm. we talk about antibiotic-free, the hormones that everybody talks about is estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, growth hormone, we don't have that in our meat. Yeah. We don't have antibiotics. Now, think about that. Like, when we start producing millions and millions of pounds, not requiring millions of liters of these ingredients mm -hmm. is actually good for the environment. Huge for the environment. Yeah. yeah. Being the, those antibiotics given to animals being the single biggest driver of antimicrobial resistance that's happening around the world. It, yeah. And uh, all manner of health effects coming off yeah. of it for animals and for us. Mm -hmm. And you know, the long tradition of meat is one towards really food safety, you know, uh, and the greatest innovations in the meat industry brought food safety to it, you know, and allowed it to scale and allowed it to feed the world. You know? Well, I think there's a glass ceiling on that because, well, I don't know if it's a glass ceiling. I don't think we can escape the fact that conventional meat will always require raising and slaughtering an animal and a full animal has a skin on which there's a lot of microbes, mm -hmm. and it has a gut that has trillions of microbes. Right. There's no way to get rid of them. Right. The only way to get rid of it and still have animal cells that we love to eat is cultivated meat. Yeah. And that's not a simple innovation. It's a transformative innovation. It's going to take time, but the first principles are sound. Shorter period for production, simplified feed, ability to use renewable energy, because you cannot plug a cow into the electric outlet. <laughs> I can plug Epic and Rubicon into the grid. Uh, dude, I'm going to ask you this question. 
what came first, the chicken or the <laughs> egg? Because <laughs> it starts with a fertilized egg, right? It starts at upside. Right, we get to right, say it right, started yes. with an egg. Here we said, well, the breeds that we have right now started with an egg. So I think we can definitely put that to an end. Mm -hmm. But what's not to say that in the future, we can take a first cell that comes from a chicken, mm -hmm. an adult chicken, without having to slaughter it. Mm -hmm. So at that point, that chicken could come from a chicken first. Now yeah. it's coming from an egg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, what's keeping you up at night? This is what, I'm going to ask you a couple rapid fire VC questions. What keeps you up at night? Um, look, this is transformative innovation, and there's going to be a roller coaster. Sometimes the roller coaster is really bumpy, and keeping that in mind every single day is important. There's some nights where it's like hard to keep it in mind because you're like, damn, this is really a roller coaster. And I want to make sure that our team understands this because sometimes you forget because you're working heads down, like the world doesn't matter. You're going after some of the most major problems to solve. And sometimes I wonder maybe we don't communicate enough how transformative this work is. It's expected to be hard. Yeah. We've always planned for it. And no transformation is ever going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight. And taking punches is part for the course. Yeah. Sometimes I think that we may forget that and that occasionally keeps me up at night. Yeah. A punch here and there. Yes. And especially you're speaking to your psyche of all of the talent that you've hired to help build this, that they stay motivated mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the long vision that we're on, not just the short one. Yes. Right? Yes. And you and I have talked many times about like the mission mm -hmm. and investors on the mission that we're on and completing the mission and we're not completing the mission. So to be super clear, Rubicon is crossing the Rubicon, scaling the Rubicon, and the mission continues from there. It is absolutely the beginning of the next chapter. Yeah. I always tell our team and also our investors that getting to first sale of product was thought of as unachievable. When I first walked and knocked on the doors of IndieBio, yeah. and Arwen came in and he said, okay, Uma, what you're going after is crazy, dude. I don't know if it's going to happen, but we believe that this is a problem that needs to be solved. Yeah. And at that point, when we talked to literally anyone, it was like, no, this is not going to happen. They were never going to get approval. We didn't get approval not just from one agency. We got approval from two agencies, and we were able to sell yeah. to people who enjoyed. Now, that's the closing of the first chapter. The second chapter is going from first sale to formidable scale. Yeah. That journey is just as unexplored, but the first principles are there, just like the last uh, chapter of the journey. So I think going to scale is going to require us to go through lots of twists and turns, but I have more conviction now than I have in tw I had in 2015 when I knocked on your doors. Wow. I'm glad to hear that, man. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn it back over to Wesley now. Thank you, Uma. Really appreciate for sitting down with us here at uh, SOSV Climate Tech. Thank, Thank you. you, Paul. Enjoy. Enjoy.